That's it, just the video and I'll be done. Um, thank you, Nordane Prep, for having me and thank you, Sabrina, and the Veterans Heritage Project. Uh, I've only started sharing my story because of students like her who ask questions and are enthusiastic about hearing what I've done in my lifetime in the military. Um, in the Army, I am called Chief Warrant Officer 2, Maddie. You can call me Chief or Ma'am. Um, to my son and daughter, I'm Mom. Um, I've had a lot of jobs in the military, as my bio had said. I've been in 15 years, and I started off as a mechanic on engineering equipment. Then I moved on and was a chemical officer, and then moved on to being a part of the special operations deployment, and finally became a helicopter pilot, which is what I do now. I kind of want to focus a little bit about defying gender stereotypes. In our culture today, I think we have this tendency to direct people on what they should or should not do based upon their gender. And I think that we can change that, and it starts with you guys. Um, I get the wow factor a lot when I tell people what I've done. I'll, they'll be talking to me, and they'll say, what do you do in the military? I'm like, oh, I was a mechanic on diesel engines, you know, the Detroit diesel, two-stroke fuel-injected engine. And they'd be like, wow, I didn't expect that from a girl. And that kind of got me thinking a little bit about the wow factor of my job in the military. And then it also continued to drive me to continue to challenge those stereotypes. So from becoming a mechanic, I moved on to a chemical officer. Um, chemical officer, I trained in chemical warfare and how to mitigate the risks for our own soldiers. I deployed as a staff sergeant under that role um, to Iraq for my second tour. On my third tour, we had the Army put out an advertisement for a call to action. They were looking for women who could meet the standards and train and deploy with special operations. The key thing to this was women were not allowed in this role. It was against DOD policy, against regulations. Our country told us, you're a woman, you cannot do that job. So they had um, a paper board. People submitted applications from all over the country um, to try out for this mission and over hundreds of applications, it got whittled down to just a few hundred that were asked to come to Fort Bragg to do an assessment and selection. An assessment and selection is a tryout. They're testing you on things physically and mentally that you don't know they're testing you on. You're just placed out there among other females. This is the first time in history that they had an all-female assessment and selection. And I can tell you that the women I was surrounded with were amazing women. They inspired me to do more in my life. We called it the CST program, Cultural Support Team. The reason that they needed women in these roles was because in Afghanistan, there's a huge cultural divide. The women cannot talk to the men, and our soldiers were almost creating more of a hostile environment because they cannot access 100% of the population. That's where we came in, a role for women. But we had to be able to access the population, talk to women, as well as be able to maintain our own as a soldier. They trained about only 60 of us passed this course out of the hundreds that applied. They split us up into two groups. The first group went with the Ranger Regiment, 
and the second group went with uh, Green Berets, an ODA team, which meant I was going to be embedded in a village in Afghanistan, not on a base. I lived in a mud compound, wore the headscarf, and interacted with the population. Security reasons, that plays a little bit of a risk because the only people that we were relying on was each other. We had our battle brothers and our battle sisters, me, one other female, and our interpreter, to maintain the security of our base. We were not welcomed at first with our Green Beret male counterparts. You know, there was a lot of the, they had stereotyped women. Women can't do this, they can't do that. Um, they had told us things like, we didn't want you here. It was the boys only club. They had like the sign, like you imagine a clubhouse and the sign said no girls allowed. It's kind of what we felt like we were getting into. So Rachel, who's my partner, and I, one night, we were on guard up on top of the roof. We had this mud compound, if you could picture, and we're looking over the village. And we see children running and stuff like that. And the sun's setting, we're on the roof, and we're interacting with our male counterparts. We had a couple infantry guys there and then the Green Berets. And we just started casually talking about why they thought women couldn't do this job. They have never worked with women before and it was a whole new territory. So the fact that we were having this conversation was a huge step. So as we're talking and maintaining our perimeter sectors of fire, uh, one of the guys said, you guys shouldn't be here because of your physical ability. He told me, you are not strong enough. You cannot carry me out of harm's way if I need it. And I knew that this was it. This was the moment I had been waiting for. My whole life of going to the gym, training, lifting weights, not to get skinny, not to focus on my looks, but to become strong was because of this moment. So I calmly, collectedly, even though in my head I'm shouting, this is it walked over to the gentleman, said, eh, how much do you weigh? He said, Meh, about 200 pounds. I said, okay. I looked at him, I said, may I? He kind of gave me a puzzled look, so I bent over, picked him up, put him over my shoulder, walked across the roof, turned around, walked back, put him down, I had full kit, body armor, all that weight. And then there was a moment of silence from everybody watching. Then the guy responded with just a simple phrase. He said, well, I'm impressed. That was it. Like everything I had trained for, I just changed one person's mind on everything he thought growing up of what women cannot, can and cannot do. I felt like I had accomplished so much and it was just, day one of being here with these, these guys and these soldiers. Um, it was kind of a good thing that I did that because we are being tested every day by these soldiers. You know, they're seeing if we can handle ourselves in stressful environments. Well, as I told you, we are deployed to a very kinetic environment, which meant it was, it was not safe. The environment we were going into was filled with Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters that did not want us there. The next day, we're having a meeting. We're in the team room. And we start just talking about kind of what we're going to do, how we're going to implement us into the team. And boom, indirect fire. Indirect fire is mortars lobbying in. So you can't really see who's shooting at you or where they're coming from or where they're gonna hit next. Start dropping a round in. Everybody hears the round. Everybody goes into training mode because you never rise to the occasion, you fall back on your training. We let all the guys run out, get to their fighting positions because we were the new ones there. So my battle sister Rachel and I do what any soldier would do. We go to our room, we get our kit on, we get to the roof and we start manning our gun and our fighting position that was assigned to us. I don't know if the guys expected us to do that or if they expected us to kind of hide in the background or cower a little bit because it was unknown territory. But what they did not realize is we were trained as soldiers, just as they were. 
We are trained to be in these situations, and this was our test to see how you could physically and mentally handle a situation with indirect fire. Luckily that day, nobody got hurt. Uh, nobody at our compound got hurt. The rounds hit further out a little bit. Um, but it got us thinking a lot about our role and how we're going to integrate ourselves with our male counterparts in this environment. So not only did we have this task of integrating with the men, we also had to integrate with the local population of the women in Afghanistan. And if you've done any research on Afghanistan, you kind of know that they are looked at as a culture of women that are suppressed and not allowed to be out in their community um, on their own, uh, which was a very eye-opening experience. Because even though they were there, we judge them, thinking that they are not smart women, they don't know anything, they're kind of a culture that's behind us. But in reality, we we're kind of facing the same battles that they were. When we talked to the women in the village, a lot of them ran the household. They were the ones in charge in that building and the ones caring for their families, just as we are the ones caring for our families. So even though they were fighting their own battle within their own society, us girls in the military communi community, we're fighting our own battles as well as trying to overcome these stereotypes. So that was only the beginning of our challenges. Throughout our time in this village, we had many more missions that we went on and many more times, whether with indirect fire or small arms fire, where we had to prove ourselves um, that we were soldiers first. And luckily, we did. Um, after that mission, the Department of Defense um, changed the laws, and women were now allowed in combat roles within our country. So I felt like we've done a huge, a huge step forward um, in letting women be able to do those combat roles. So I want to challenge all of you today to start thinking about some gender stereotypes, whether male or female, on things that you know, you've been told throughout your life that you can or cannot do because of your gender. Does anybody have any examples? OK, how about advertising for children? We look at our toys. Look at our toys. The boys are supposed to play with cars. The girls are supposed to play with dolls. I mean, it starts when we're young, and I think we don't even realize that it's happening in our society. So just kind of start thinking about that when you're going along in your life. Um, after my deployment to Afghanistan and facing all those troubles, I kind of thought in my head, well, I've done it. I've done this, accomplished this one whole thing. And then I decided, well, I'm going to go to flight school, another role that has been filled with pretty much only men. Um, at flight school, I was the only girl in my class, um, which faced its own challenges, as well as there was no uh, female instructor pilots. I was surrounded by all these men again. Um, they put me as class leader, which meant I had to manage everybody in the class, as well as manage my own time for studying and making sure that um, I could fly the helicopter. Um, everything that I've done in my career has kind of, kind of just something I've done. I've never really talked about it um, until the Veterans Heritage Project started asking me these questions, and I get feedback from students saying the same kind of thing. I get the wow factor, the wow, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't, I didn't know women could do that. Um, so it's been really motivating to have this opportunity to come talk to all of you. So I'd like to take this time, if anybody has any questions about anything in my career, um, if they'd like to know about anything in my video, what it's like, where I went, anybody? I'm gonna pick on somebody, yeah. What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced like, mentally? One of the biggest challenges I faced mentally would have to be the assessment and selection process for the um, special operations mission. Um, because you go into this process and you don't know what they're looking for. Normally if you go into like a test or something, you kind of know, hey, this is what I need to study to be there. 
But for this, they were looking at your overall character and content. And so knowing that we had to do physical ruck marches and not know the distance, or we had, they were looking at how we interacted with our peers, I think mentally going into that, being surrounded by all these other amazing women really challenged me mentally. And I had to re-cage how I thought about what I was doing in the military and not make it a personal thing, but make it I'm, a, I'm part of a team now. So I really felt that was great. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Was this something you always wanted to do? Like, you know, like from a little girl, like I wanted to do this, or was this something that you developed later? Great question. This is not at all what I wanted to do when I was a little girl. Um, it, military was barely on my radar, except for World War II vets like my grandparents. Um, the kind of thought of me going into the military was an overnight decision. Um, can I ask my mom? She's here. Hi, mom. I'm sure she was like, what are you thinking? Um, but I've kind of developed it. Opportunities have kind of opened up throughout my career. Um, and now I find myself 15 years in with an amazing history of things that I have done. So that's another good point. Make sure you keep your doors open. If something's going to come into your life that you think you can't do, take a chance. You never know what you can or cannot do until you actually try. Yes, in the back. Who empowers me? I'm very much empowered by my mom. Growing up, she had always taught me, you can do anything, you can do anything. I don't think she expected me to believe it as much as I did um, and try everything that I've done, but even starting in high school, I tried out for the girls hockey team. We started the inaugural girls hockey team. And I remember my mom telling me, you know, Rose, you, you can't skate, you can't stop, you're kind of going to get hurt. I don't think this is your best thing to do. And I said, Mom, you said I could do anything. I could do anything. So I went every day, and practiced at the ice rink, and skated until I figured out how I could do this. And I ended up making varsity that year. So thanks, Mom. <laughs> Oh, some of the places I've been deployed. I have been to Iraq twice, to Camp Taji. Um, I've also done a mission in Kenya, and I've been at the Jordanians Peace Operation Training Center in Jordan. Um, and then my last mission was Afghanistan. So I have I've been over that Middle East a bit. <laughs> yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna address that right now. You know, that is. That is a question that is not appropriate to ask a soldier. I know our society glorifies it and all that stuff, but no, it's good for everybody to hear this, and it's okay. I'm going to talk about it. It's good. It's good. I'm going to let you know that you never want to ask a soldier that. If you're interested in that kind of topic, a good book called On Killing by Dan Grossman addresses the psychological effect of doing something like that. And I recommend you read that before you ask the next question, OK? Yeah. I joined the Army when I was 20 years old. And so at basic training, I turned 20. They thought it was really funny to say, hey, private, drop and give me 20. So that's, I will never forget that. Drop and give me 20. Yes. Oh, great question. So I started off um, as a private, and I spent 10 years enlisted, made it up to the rank of staff sergeant. Um, and then after my deployment to Afghanistan, I had to apply to become an officer to be a pilot. So I put in an application, and I became a warrant officer um, and went to school for that prior to my flight school. So I'm now an officer. Okay. Yes? Having been over there and deployed, do you think the situation is getting any better? Um, I think it's hard, it's hard to say because everybody has different ideas on how to fix that situation. And it really it comes down to a lot of politics and it comes down to people within their own community are going to have to fix it themselves. You know, you wouldn't want somebody going into your house and your home saying, 
you've got this all wrong. This is how you need it. This is how you need to do it. So it's really going to take the strength of their own community and education. I really feel education in order to make it another a stable environment in the Middle East. And are they open to that? Oh, absolutely. Yes. The people that I uh, interacted with. Um, on the everyday, like we were in a very rural village. There was no road to get there. We had to get dropped in from helicopter. They have no communication. Um, everything is word of mouth. And so when it's a community like that, with the word of mouth, all you believe is what somebody told you. And you have no way to fact check it or to get the whole big picture. Um, when it came to the schools there, the Taliban had control of the schools. And so of course they were teaching what they wanted to be taught. Um, but the, the kids, love the idea of learning. Even the girls, the young girls, um, I've given some paper and some notes and her dad was bragging to me on, oh, I'm teaching my daughter to read, you know, and you see moments like that where you're inspired to get more education over there and let them make their own decisions for their own community. So great questions, yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and I'll tell you, the. The body gives up way before the mind. I mean, the mind gives up before your body. You are a lot stronger in your head than you think you can be. I've, um, I've ran a couple marathons because of that reason. I, somebody told me, hey, you can't run a marathon. And them telling me that kind of made me go, well, why not? So I started training. And when you get to that mile 20, because the marathon is 26.2, your mind is what makes you want to stop. And so, if you have the mind to do something and the determination that you can do anything, anything you want. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to take one last question. Yeah. Um, so, training, it kind of depends on which job. So, my training, basic training, they call it basic for everybody. So, you learn to shoot, move, communicate. Um, you learn your basic soldiering skills, how to shoot your rifle, how to march in formation, and kind of the language of the military. Then after that, I moved on what they call advanced individual training, um, and that's where they teach you how to fix the trucks and how to learn that skill. Um, so that's how each one of those schools training. The special oper operations training went a little more in depth, and I can't tell you exactly what they trained us on, but it was a lot of the kind of things of overcoming your mind mentality, um, as well as the, the physical stuff you would need to be um, keep up with the Green Berets. Okay, we got one more. Oh, yes. Um, so, she brought up a good point. One of our, um, one of our soldiers in this mission, um, she was deployed with the Ranger Regiment. It's kind of hard to talk about it, but um, she brought it up. She was actually killed in combat. Um, and there is a book written about her called Ashley's War. And the significance of her sacrifice for our country kind of motivated the conversation about women in combat. And um, if you get a chance, read about her story, Ashley White. Um, she was an amazing girl, another one that really pushed herself physically and mentally to become strong. And unfortunately, on patrol, she was hit by an IED. Um, so remember that even though it sounds all fun and glorious what I do, there's serious moments that you, we have to consider. Um, so with that, I'd like to take just a little bit of time to everybody remember Ashley, and then we'll go into our video again uh, to conclude.